our speakers is right, and that's Kate McDonald, who is a, an assistant professor of English literature at Ghent University in Belgium, and is the author of many books, book chapters and articles on 20th century popular culture and literary history. She is a visiting research fellow for a term at the Bodleian Univers um, Library at um, Oxford University and is currently working on a project investigating depictions of physical impairment in British popular culture during the First World War. And Kate's presentation is about seeing disability in British First World War popular culture. So uh, thank this is you. Kate, thanks for coming. Thank you. I'm really sorry I wasn't here earlier, but I took three hours to get here from Oxford rather than one because it's a sequence, wow. not my uh -huh. So I'm here now, all is good. My project is about the things that ordinary people read, looked at and were exposed to in terms of Greek culture during the First World War and into the 20s and 30s. In autumn 2013, I had a visiting research fellowship at King's College of London where I did work in the British Library and in the Bodleian Library looking at fiction magazines because the fiction magazine, the story, was a very common way for people to spend their free time. And so I surveyed a great, many, a great number of fiction magazines looking for evidence of impairment. For this term, I'm doing the same thing with the visual record, looking at postcards, newspaper adverts, posters, um, and other things that are clearly visual rather than textual. And what I'm going to do just now is start with some initial images from the present day, which you probably will be familiar with, and then go back a hundred years, and we can consider how images are presented to the public now in popular culture, and how they were presented then. So, the first one is an image that came on the online independent newspaper on the 1st of November. This was the lead story at the beginning of that day, and it caught my eye because it's an image of, an, of a, a soldier with impairment. Um, the image started to go down, you know in online newspapers the stories disappear, they go down the, um, the rankings. By the middle of the afternoon, this one was so far down you really had to look for it. So its popularity was not great. But what struck me was that the image makes this man, Rifleman Craig Wood, look like a doll. He's broken, he's sitting on a bench, he's not moving, he has no agency. And I found this very striking because this was the only image to illustrate this story, which was for a book and an exhibition. The book is by the rock star Brian Adams, a book of photographs of war wounded servicemen from Iraq and Afghanistan. It's also in an exhibition at Somerset House. And what I found seriously striking about this image was that the leaflet for the exhibition the same man, a completely different image. He's much stronger. This is a man with mild facial impairment. There is no loss of agency. So I was struck how the, how the newspaper chose to manipulate the feelings about the impaired soldier, whereas the exhibition told a completely different story. And these are available. I've got three left, so if you'd like them, take them. The only other national story, national newspaper that weekend to cover this story was the Daily Telegraph. And automatically we have a dyad between the left wing and the right wing in terms of the media. The Guardian are left wing, less keen on war, certainly anti-war in some areas. The Telegraph are very pro-military and very keen on patriotism. The image shown here from the same set of exhibition photographs and also in the book is of two men who hardly consider their impairments at all because these are images of strength, positivity and competence. They are not about, I'm just sitting here waiting for something to happen. These men are capable of doing something. So the Telegraph again chose one image, but chose a different story to tell through that image. Two days later, the big issue came out. So that week, I don't know if you saw it, Peter, you won't know about this. It's a street magazine. It's very famous in Britain. It's a weekly thing. Um, but this is a national mass market news, a magazine that anybody can buy. And they chose another image from Brian Adams' book as a cover story, plus inside a double page spread. And again, what's striking here is that we have more photographs, we have a wider range of individuals, and we have information about their stories, their lives, we begin to learn about them as people. 
We don't concentrate solely on the wound or competence or not competent. We think about these are people who have gone through an experience and now what are they doing? Again, a totally different experience from the reading of this popular culture. So, the images are interesting because they have, a, a, they have um, relevance for accessibility. The photographs anyone can look at, the exhibition is free. It has disabled access, so anyone can go and look at them. A very small number of photographs, possibly 10 or 11. The book, only £55, should one have that amount of money to spend on a large book, but there's an awful lot of very, very good photographs in it. You can also see the image, some of the images online on the, photographer, on the publisher's website. But the exhibition's only in London, it only has a limited run, so there are different stories about accessibility and how people can see these pictures and for how long and how much they have to cost. But my final point on this particular slide is that the whole point of my project is cultural research should be linked to the needs of society today. It's all very well working in an ivory tower in Oxford, as I had the deep pleasure of doing before this term, only in my god, it's fantastic. Everybody would have this experience, and anyone could. One just applies for certain things. But there is no point doing ivory tower research unless it can relate to how people live now and how we can learn from the past to improve the present. So, let us now think about other ways of using disability research. Sometime earlier this year, this story, which frankly I did not see until it was shown to my friend recently, I think it's in the Australian edition of the Guardian. You can look for it by googling the phrase Woven Gargoyles Guardian or the post colonial blog. Its importance, I think, is that it's a story of an Australian academic tracing the stories of soldiers who underwent reconstruction surgery during the war in Kent. This is the first slide picture you see. If one scrolls down, you get this very, very striking image, which is quite disturbing for those who are not accustomed to looking at, face, at faces who have had disfigurement like this. The story of the text is about the, the academic researcher's uh, struggles to find evidence, and also about this man's story. His name is William Kearsley. Um, and this was the, and he lived a long and happy life, got married and died at a reasonable old age, as we find out in the story. So this is a different way of treating impairment of the body through war by making the story about the whole man and his experiences. Now, going back a hundred years, this is what my project's about. So what I'm doing, looking for depictions of physical impairment. I'm not looking for emotional, psychological or um, mental impairment from war because, frankly, I can only do so much. And the physical is something one can focus on. In popular culture, I'm not interested in literary modernism, I'm not interested in elite publications for small audiences, I'm looking for the materials that my great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents would have seen, because this seems like a much bigger proportion of society. Social history is my foundation, but English literature is my background, and I'm using disability theory in studies as a way into the interpretation of what I see. <coughs> And I'm looking at the First World War because of the colossal spike in the demographics of the impaired men in the British population at that time. Because my hypothesis is, and I think my slide is here, yes, um, there is a new awareness of social demarcation associated with the, with the impaired body happening in the First World War. I want to find out why this is happening because obviously some kinds of impairment became more deserving than others around this time. You can see this in evidence in the 1920s. So I'm looking for what happened during the war in any sphere to find out why this happened. So, I've told you about my earlier research. Um, if you want to ask me questions about that later, I'll come back to it, but I shall now. This is what I'm doing now. I'm looking at the, a particular collection of printed ephemera, which is a collection put together by the printer to the university who liked print, and he collected anything that was printed. So we have a vast number of boxes and card indexes, and huge folders, this big, full of posters, of anything that was printed. So I'm looking at that is my purpose. And I'm looking for physical impairment in this. It's not uh, quantitative, because there's no way of counting what they amounts are, it's just simply looking at individual items and thinking about them as quality research. Now I'm going to go through the different categories that I found these materials 
um, could be collected in as they relate to disability. And the biggest one is disability treated as a joke. Whether we find it funny is a different matter. But the sense of humour at the time did seem to find disability funny in itself or really helpful to make jokes. So this one, it draws on two tropes. We've got the idea of the frustrated spinster, desperate for a man. We've got the idea of the mean Scotsman who is desperate not to spend money. He's sitting on a, a bath chair. He is impaired in that his mobility is affected, whether it's permanent or not, we don't know. But he's in the dilemma. Now then, Jock, lend me a bob or I'll leave you to it. Meaning, I will leave you to the, the fate that awaits you with this dreadful woman. This was considered funny. You don't have to laugh. <laughs> this is... Ah, I think I've used this twice. No, no, it's alright. This is also a joke, but this is a German postcard. There were... Oops, there are a large number of German and Austrian, Austro-Hungarian materials in this collection. This one shows the Allies. You have France on the left, then you have Russia in the middle, and then you have England on the right. Notice that Russia has got his knee up on a wooden peg leg, but you can see his foot. So he's pretending to be disabled, but he isn't. I think the message from this German postcard is, We've beaten the, our enemies so hard, they're now saying, oh, look at us, we're so disabled, it's dreadful, but actually they're faking it. So it's a propagandist message. It's crude, it derives from an 18th century satirical tradition, but it's using impairment as a way of making the reader laugh. Mm. These two, and I've been giving this talk in various oh. guises for the last week or so to five other audiences, and every time I want them to say, do you find these funny cars funny? So what do you think? We have a man, Tom Hopkirk, and his fragments from France. And he's standing there on crutches, clearly missing one leg, and he has all his war booty displayed around him, as if they were triumphs of war. The other card, an unnamed man, pictured twice, one before, as he was going into war, and once after, in hospital uniform, missing the lower parts of both his legs. And he has a big grin on his face. But these are presented to the reader as being funny. But do you find them funny? What do you think when you see these pictures? Anything? Mm. I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly how they're supposed to be funny. This is the thing. They're sold. As, well, okay, I'll explain. The Tom Hopker. His Fragments from France, that phrase, Fragments from France, refers to a very famous book of cartoons at the time by the British cartoonist Bruce Bairnsfather. Mm. And his first collected work of satirical, 19, sorry, satirical um, cartoons from, from, from newspapers was called Fragments from France. And it was all about jokes about the army in the trenches. Mm. And it is quite funny. I mean, I've read it. It's quite good. So this is clearly a reference to that collection. And the fragments that Tom Hopkirk has collected, they are his fragments from France, mm. as is, you might say, his body. It is mm. a fragment because it is, has been broken. The other card, I think, has to be assumed as funny because the man on the, well, the, the man in his later guise has such a big grin on his face. Now, when I first mm. saw the double figure, I could not stop myself snorting going like that because this is ridiculous, this is grotesque, how can I be expected to... And it was a, a, dis a disruptive sense of feelings. So I'm interested, do other people <coughs> have a similar response, or are you just simply gobsmacked? Yeah? A lot of kind of photographs I've seen of disabled kind of veterans in wheelchairs, I don't know obviously why that was taken from mm -hmm. the they are smiling. Yeah. And that's something that's always kind of interesting me with that. Okay. So, I, I mean, I've been kind of looking into whether they're smiling because they've been told to, mm. or so I still don't. That's a kind of a bit uneasy about whether uneasiness is. Yeah, yeah. The uneasiness seems to be the common response when I have asked this question before, because we simply don't know if we're allowed to laugh, or allowed to smile, or find it wouldn't. <coughs> we cannot connect to the sense of taste at the time, and also what the relevance is. I mean, we don't understand the context. We don't know if he was put in that chair and told to smile, or whether he said, no, I'm sitting here and I want to smile, and I take my picture now. We have no idea of the agency. And that makes it difficult for us. But I think, certainly with Tom Hopper, we can accept this was intended, this was produced as a postcard to be posted. 
as a slightly funny, jokey thing. Okay, I'll leave that with you. We'll move on to disability is romance. The disabled man, the disabled war-impaired ex-soldier was very, very commonly presented as a figure of romance. <coughs> This is really dominant in the fiction. I found a huge amount of evidence showing that the, the principal way to compensate a man from coming back from war with an impairment was to give him a wife and, if possible, the Victoria Cross as well. The evidence is overwhelming from my corpus of fiction. <laughs> and I'm now seeing it in the postcards too. The visual record corroborates this. The card on the left is a gathering of men in a secluded lane. They're all wearing wounded hospital uniform and they're snogging their women. And that's delightful and funny, but they're cartoons. The card on the right is actually from a book. It's a French cartoon, and the translation of the line below says something like, um, I may have a wooden leg, but I don't have a wooden heart. <laughs> and he's kissing her hand, it's just so romantic, and he's got a very, very obvious false leg. This is an Austrian card, printed for the Austrian Red Cross. The photograph's a bit fuzzy, my camera wasn't working well that day. But again, we have a heroic officer, swooping coat, the crutch, the missing leg, and the adoring work nurse looking at him with, again, romance. Romance is what we're expected to see. Card on the left, we have a man in the top corner, like a, a small focus picture. He's sitting, he's missing his left arm because his great coat is very tightly wrapped around. You can see there's no arm there. And he's sitting in a Red Cross in Canada. There's a Red Cross and there's um, military doctors at the back. And the woman in the foreground, she's expressing a sentimental verse. So we have romance and we have pathos as well. But the card I like best is on the right, Comrades in Arms, which is using this, the iconography of the cinema. This is a matinee idol. Look at the shine on his hair, the beautiful parting. He is like Rudolph Valentino. And he's holding her tightly to his breast. He's doing the manly thing with one arm. His missing arm is accentuated by her use of both her arms. Oh. So this is a very striking image of the disabled ex-soldier, and he's an officer too, this is important. The sword and the spurs, definitely officer class, even more desirable. The message is you must feel romantically. Disability as a rehabilitation opportunity. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Um, did you find any evidence of, of um, uh, pity in terms of... Coming to that. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> oh. Right, this will be after this section. Disability as a rehabilitation opportunity. These are two of a long series of cards from the Austrian Red Cross showing how men with prostheses can be retrained to become economically productive members of society again. I particularly like the one on the right because it's, he's still wearing his army uniform with the peak cap and the blue um, jacket. This is a photograph from The Sphere, which was a society weekly magazine in Britain. A long article advocating the use of war-impaired servicemen with lower limb impairment that have fully, full mobility in their hands to do diamond cutting. So these men were to be retrained as skilled technicians in a luxury trade in modern conditions with very good working, you know, a, a specially built factory and so on for their, to, to cope with their impairment and their mobility. And there are a lot of photographs like this. I like this one because diamond sawing by a legless man, yet he is standing on what appears to be two legs. So clearly the prosthesis are subtle enough to be completely invisible underneath trousers, which is quite an advance. This, two cards from the German side, the left hand side we have German soldiers bowing their heads in shame because they're wounded and cannot work. Germany, the woman in white, the uh, symbolic image is saying it's okay, here are the tools to help you work and behind her the older generation who could not serve are giving money. The other side, the German man is shamed because he only has one arm to do his masculine bashing with a mallet and the axes. And the sea of grey underneath that little cherub figure are the hands of the people supporting him. They're offering the support, the hands that he does not have. So these are strong images from the German tradition. Eight minutes left. Okay, I can go. Disability to be supportive. This is where the pathos comes in. Um, the caption for the card on the left, the child you will never see. This privileges 
the loss of sight. We've already seen in one of the leaflets back there that full blindness was to be given a 100% pension after the First World War. There's nothing said about he can still touch, he can still smell, he can still talk to the child, he can still hold the child, he can take the child for walks. All those are ignored because blindness is a privileged impairment. Um, notice also the woman is supporting him and stopping him dropping the baby because he's a man he can't possibly know how to hold a baby. The other side, the man sitting on his own with his faithful dog. There is a sense of isolation but also a sense that the dog has to be there, the man needs the dog because nobody else is there with him. So the man needs support because of his impairment, he's bowing his head. It's, it's not, a, not a positive image except for the dog, if you like dogs. <laughs> Oh, okay, I don't know, I'm not a dog lover. Disability is isolation. This is a rare image by Louis Ramakers, the Dutch cartoonist who was very famous at the beginning of the war because he excelled in almost pornographic images of brutality by the Germans against the Belgian population. This dates from 1917. It's a frontispiece to a book advocating the setting up of industrial villages for partially disabled soldiers and servicemen. But this man, he's completely isolated. There's nothing between him and the home you might wish for in the far distance. It's a sad image. On the other side, we've got the boy who we presume has been impaired in his leg because it's sticking out in a rather unnatural angle ahead of him. And in his mind, the images above, floating above, are what he used to do when he was a schoolboy, all the physical sports and the physical activities he did, now gone forever, we are expected to understand, which in truth was not the case. But that's, this is what the, the card would have us say. Disability is fine art. I was really quite struck by how many exceptionally good watercolour and oil colour oil paintings there were used to convey the process of being impaired to make us feel sorry. The card on the right, so the one on the left here is a British image, um, a card sold in aid of the National Institute of the Blind. The card on the right is a German one, I think it's taken from an art gallery, but it's in the tradition of Albert Dürer. This is a medieval engraving tradition which is very strong, very powerful. It's a beautiful image, but it also involves impairment and there are messages coming through there. And finally, Disability is propaganda. We've already seen that one. I'd put it in this morning and I'd forgotten it was already there. But it's still a propaganda image as well as funny. This one on the left I find very, very striking. The man is sowing the seed. Doing this, he's sowing the seed in the traditional way. His left arm is either extremely from in front of him, which I don't think is actually possible. I think it's simply the stump of an arm that's been cut off because he's suffered impairment in the war. He's still got his peak cut from his uniform. But notice where he is. This is a German card. He's on the banks of a broad river, and across the, the river we see a windmill. I suggest that this is an image about the German soldier sowing the seeds for future growth on the banks of the, of the Dutch border. <coughs> with the potential for further expansion and moving um, back into the lands. Do you think that's a feasible? Yeah, I think that's why I get it. Yeah, I mean, I just thought Windmill mm -hmm. Holland. I don't think Eastern, I don't think Western Germany has windmills. I really think it's a lowlands. Mm -hmm. what, 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 what about the sunset? Um, Doesn't it that's the west. promise it's a promise that something will <coughs> future for the disabled soldier? Well, if it's sunset, it's definitely not sunset. Not sunset, uh, the, the sunrise. Yeah, sunrise. Well, in that case, he's up, the, the windmill's moved into Germany, and that's really strange. I don't know, it's, it's a okay. debatable, but I put it to you that this could well be a propaganda <coughs> image using physical impairment of the ex soldier with a potential for looking up, let's go back and get the territory in just place. And with that, this is what I'm doing next, looking at song lyrics next and stage plays, because there's a lot of potential there. Um, and I'm doing an awful lot of academic publications, but my ultimate goal is to do a proper book for your general public, with lots and lots of pictures. And the Bodley have told me I do not need to worry about paying for permissions. They're very happy for me to use these images pretty much for free, which is great. So there will be a book in two parts. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments or thoughts for Kate? Yes, gentlemen, behind me. Hi. Yes. Hi. 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 Um, it's not at all a question, it's just a question, honestly, but I, I wondered why you focused in on this area or these areas of physical impairment. Why 
or whether in fact you've come across inadvertently images, say for example, of deafness, which is oh. a, a, an issue, an area redolent with um, metaphor and you know, all sorts of patronage and all that, but also mental health. Yeah. There's a lot of stuff in the war in terms of, of you know, post-traumatic stress and, and all those kind of things, and distress and, oh. and, and stressful experiences. And again, there's lots of imagery around all of that. Yeah. And, I, and I appreciate you have to focus on something that doesn't become too big, but I wonder whether either well, you made a conscious choice not to do it, or whether you've come across imagery inadvertently anyway that you could comment on. The, the, beginning, <coughs> the beginning of my this research area for me was, well, before this, I was, I'm a specialist on the British writer John Buchan, who wrote The 39 Steps, among many other novels. Right. And I studied one of his novels called Hunting Tower, 1922, which is a really excellent, jolly thriller set in Scotland in which you have a group of war-impaired British servicemen who all have minor impairments, but, you know, 15% pension, 25% pension, pitted against a group of Bolsheviks who are not only foreign and left-wing, but they've all got congenital impairment. And the opposition was just so striking, I had to write about it, and that made me think, well, if this exists in popular culture in 22, what was happening during the war to produce this. So the physical, my real focus is war impairment versus congenital impairment, industrial injury, injury through disease. So it's the men who could not serve because they were born that way or they had accidents happen, versus the way society treated the war impaired servicemen who came back after service. So that is my focus. I, I completely appreciate there are many other areas, but as you say, I've only got one life. But, no, but even, even though that's the focus you've chosen to focus there on the imagery. Absolutely. Well, I, because my background is English literature, I started with the fiction. Um, and to be truthful, I have not found evidence of deafness in the fiction I've been looking at. I found a little bit of congenital impairment, not very much. I found in the popular fiction survey I did last autumn, out of 4,000 stories, I found no shell shock. No emotional trauma, no psychological trauma, which is embarrassing because this shows there is a colossal fundamental omission in the teaching of English literature of the his of, of literature of the war. Um, so that's my answer. Is that, is that? That's helpful. Mm -hmm. Good. Take my turn back there, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I know you're only looking at one particular era, um, but I was really interested in the way in in which you you classified these figures and, and mm -hmm. you know particularly you know thinking about the figure of rehabilitation and the figure of romance and mm -hmm. I was wondering about lines of continuity mm -hmm. between the representations of the period you were looking at and more recent representations and whether you've you've picked up on them in particular or whether you haven't had a chance to I haven't had through. a chance. I would like to make some commentary on the stuff I found from hundred years ago with contemporary um, collocations, but at the moment I haven't got there, but it's something that I, I would hope to do, certainly for the book, because I need to bring that up to date, to make a link between how, why it's worth going back a hundred years. So you had any hunches? Um, off the top of my head, no, it probably occur to me at three in the morning, but right now, no, I can't think of any. Sorry. Richard and then yeah. later. So. Interesting you focused on John Buchan because I believe he was retained by the, the security services to write propaganda throughout the, the First World War and, and wrote a great deal of it um, uh, in terms it? of... Uh, uh, but not, not throughout, no. John Buchan was, at the beginning of the war, he was a journalist. He turned into a war historian as well. With, for the company, well, the firm he was a part, became a partner in, Thomas Nelson. He was employed as a war correspondent by the Times and the Morning Post from June to 1916. In no, no, 1915, in June 1916, he was employed by the War Office and the Foreign Office to become a writer of military history for General Hay. December, no, January 1917, he became director of the Ministry of Information, and that's when the propaganda became much more obvious. Whether you consider his journalism and his fiction and his essays to be propaganda before that date is moot. I mean, there are lots of different ways of considering sure. it, but yeah. I, I read Paul Spell's book on it, and where he certainly takes that position for, yeah. for the whole of it. But anyway, interesting. Yeah. But the, the, the wider point that I was going to make. Um, <laughs> I'll come back to me. I'll, I'll, 
I was just I was just wondering, you know, because having grown up myself in Austria, I just remember my grand grandmother actually showing me pictures like this, right? Or postcards. And uh, I was just thinking like I mean, there are not many people alive that you can actually talk to, but mm -hmm. just considering this discussion that we just had about the windmill and what it actually means, I, I was wondering, are you talking to people who might... Well, you know, I, I have German colleagues. I mean, this is something I'm... But, but I really have, I've only uncovered these pictures in the last four weeks. I see. So it's really fresh off the fresh stuff. stuff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, it was my intention to go back to the Austrian material and look at what the Austrian Red Cross archives had. Yeah. and see what else they were, of where the stuff was first printed. Um, and also to, you know, to run the German stuff past my German colleagues and say, well, what do you think? Yeah. Is this familiar? Is this bizarre? And so on. But yeah, I will get there. Uh, I just had uh, a couple of methodological uh, questions. Ah. And, uh, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> no, it, it struck me that you kind of use uh, images coming from very different uh, mm. geographies and I, I was just wondering did the image play a similar role in England as it did in Austria or in Germany? Well, this what, is what about the, the, the visual culture in that particular yeah, period? This is a strange thing. Well, well my, my corpus was a collection of the body and whole because it is the John Johnson collection for ephemera and, and it's a, it was put together by, by one man so methodologically I think that's a sound basis to proceed on he felt like collecting his group. Mm -hmm. um, when I was looking at the images I saw nothing that the German stuff was producing from the British side. So the fine art stuff, the German fine art was of a far higher quality than the British fine art. I didn't see any propaganda messages in the British material that I saw in the German and Austrian stuff, and that surprised me. And you know, I've scoured these boxes. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it certainly doesn't exist in this collection. And one could go on forever. And I'd like to go and look at the Red Cross archives where they're held in London, but no time yet. And I need to go to the Imperial War Museum and just, yeah. and just double check what have they got that I haven't got and what have I got that they haven't got. No, I think that's fair enough. But yeah. what I'm wondering is whether the people who are living in Austria back then, mm -hmm. people who are living in England uh, back then, whether they incorporated the images that were sh shown to them in the same manner. Uh, oh, I, I, I mean, yeah. isn't well, that also look, an important question? The, the reason it? why I've got the German and the Austrian material is that they were posted by British soldiers to their friends in Britain. Okay. So mm -hmm. they were, I don't know if they were, they got hold of them after the war. Okay. I, there are no dates on any of these things. Mm -hmm. But they're in this collection in the Bodleian because a British man received them or was given them by the friends and family. So, in a way, it's actually irrelevant what the original Austrian recipients were expected to think it's more these have made their okay. way back to Britain and what's the response in Britain to this sort of material? That's a question I think I can legitimately ask. Okay, I, I Is that what yeah, yeah, Good, yeah. thank you. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, no, I remember what I wanted to say. You, you said your broader thrust was to look at were the, the, the veteran disabled ex-soldier yeah. Treated differently to those who had industrial or congenital impairment. Mm -hmm. What what was it, what do you think mm. so far into what your research? What um, what's your conclusion? So I think far? Pop, I think popular media paid almost no attention whatsoever to the mm -hmm. to the congenitally impaired, the industrial injured in terms of visual imagery. Mm -hmm. um, looking at, for example, posters encouraging men to join up. The military posters from the army and the navy are very straightforward and we've seen many reproductions. But I've been looking at posters from the mining industry and for the colliers encouraging them to join the merchant navy. And in those posters there is a, there is a distinct paragraph saying compensation for disability will be paid. But this does not exist in the military posters, probably because the military did not expect married men to join up in 1914. So there's that difference. That's pretty much the only obvious difference I've seen where you can measure two similar media together. In the fiction, I've got a lot of data about the depiction of the congenitally industrial and you know, disease impaired. And there is complexity. 
it's too early for me to say categorically that they're all wicked hunchbacks, excuse my language, evil dwarves, crippled men, blind, heroic orphans with a crutch. I mean, all this, this is archetypal stuff from the 19th and the 18th century, and it's still appearing in early 20th century fiction, but it's still, it's complicated. These characters are, still, are characters, they're not just archetypes. But there is a lot of work to be done on untangling what I found. So, a lot for the fiction, almost nothing in the visual left That's the best I can do. Thank you. You're welcome. Would you like to make a final comment? I was, uh, I was wondering whether you, I was wondering whether there was the, there was the, um, there was the changing, changing attitudes. Before, before and after conscription came in, came in 1916. There is, I haven't seen anything um, in the visual record. Mm. In the fictional record, yes, there is a, a, even at the beginning of the war, mm. you, there are scattering of stories where a character with an impairment is actively encouraging men to join up. After conscription, this sort of thing stops. So, I, I, it's complicated because by 1916, the quantities of impaired men returning from war were so large already. I believe the statistic is every month from February 1915, 350 men came back. So the population was already experiencing a very visible increase in impairment with wars as a direct result. And I think because of that, the fiction simply stopped using disabled men to send the unimpaired off again. Mm. You'd think so, it'd be like me. Sorry? You can imagine the recruitment bloke, sorry, it was flippant on, on health. Absolutely, right? yeah. Uh, you yeah, join up and lose a leg just like I yeah, exactly. yeah, right. It's um, But it, it's complicated. I mean, about the corpus of stories, I started with 4,000 stories. I read five fiction magazines from July 1914 all the way through to December 1918. And these were pitched at slightly different readerships, upper class right down to fairly cheap. And out of those 4,000 stories, only 5% featured a character with an impairment of any kind. So that's a corpus of 181 stories. So my, my survey is really only of 181, but 4,000 was the original. Sorry, we're going to have to wrap up because we've really got to move on now. Um, Peter, if you want to set up your presentation. <laughs> We are going to be having a 